Um, thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, one, the first question is to the question about India. Um, the ethnic fragmentation of India was mentioned, and I can quite understand that it's a convenient way to handle this kind of research. But it seems to me, on the other hand, that it also perpetuates uh, the fragmentation of Indian society um, because of this approach. Uh, connected with that, um, however, ethnic fragmentation in India might be a, a blessing in disguise because if the Hindus were all united, then the other minorities in India would suffer a great deal, such as the Christians and the Muslims and so on. So perhaps it's um, a God's blessing that, you know, fragmentation in India actually does exist, which, by the way, was perpetuated also by the British colonial power. Uh, yeah. Then I come to Guatemala, uh, and that is that um, what will be the consequence of this research on the future prospects for the, Latin, the um, indigenous people of Guatemala? Mm -hmm. and also for the indigenous people in other parts of Latin America, because the genocide has already more or less finished, but the discrimination still goes on against the uh, Amerindian population in, in practically all the Latin American countries. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm and sorry. secondly, what is the reason for the discrimination against indigenous people in, La in Guatemala and Latin America? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to collect a few more questions, but please try to rapid fire questions here. Miguel. Okay, just, just very briefly. Uh, I just want to raise uh, two points uh, in, re in, re in relation to what Francis was saying and in, in relation to the last presentation, uh, especially in the, in the sense of the selection of your sample. So I was quite uh, surprised uh, and concerned about the selection simply because the, the characteristics of your students seems to me that don't, really don't represent the distribution of preferences and views. So you most likely have lower bounds, ACMA, so actually the, the views and perceptions of women in Pakistan. But your response about how to deal that was really surprising to me, the language. So I really encourage you to, uh, to do something about it. Thanks. Uh, this is to Bharti uh, on the question on India and also related to what Francis was saying because she, the, the un, your unit of analysis is at the district but we know that the public good provision is uh, tied to the constituency levels because and that's where the reservation and all those things happens like either the MLA or the MP members of parliament or members of legislative assembly constituencies. So if you move from a district level to a constituency level measure, maybe things would change because reservation policies are all implemented at that level and which might be, which might also give us some results on political influence in the public good push. Thanks. One more question here in the front. So also trying to be very, very quickly, and again on the, on the same study on, on India. Uh, so one of the things that I, that I noticed is picking, picking up on something that Francis said is how much of the saliency of the boundaries is actually what's causing this relation between fractionalization and, and uh, lack of access or unequal, unequal access to the, to the public services. And just to also reinforce something that you suggested, and I think it would be a very good idea, intersecting economic classes, let's call it by that, quantiles uh, in income with those identities and see whether that affects access to, to those services. So I'll, um, I'll ask a final question, just picking up on, on Ricardo's last question. So I was also wondering about intersectional, intersecting identities, and if any of you have looked at that. I know several of you have, but uh, if there's anything you want to comment on, on intersections between different types of identities in the work. Um, so we are at time, but I want to give each of you one minute to answer your favorite question, <laughs> and then um, please continue the conversation over the break. Carla, why don't you start? Okay. So, thank, thanks for the questions. Very quickly, so the re reasons for discriminations to indigenous people in Latin America, they started at the colonial period, right? So they have been quite persistent, mostly economic reasons. So during colonial period, they were basically slaves, in Latin America until the 50s or 70s, indigenous peoples were, so, uh, were sold with the land, 
right, that they were working on. Um, during, uh, we have the commodities bomb, right, so coffee plantations, cacao plantations, banana plantations. Indigenous people are cheap hand labor. So it has been like that since uh, colonial time until today. They mostly work in agricultural sector. And the consequence of the research for the indigenous population in Latin America in general is that, you see, is, is the point we wanted to make is we treat them as one homogeneous group, and that's not the case. So if we are having an a, a, um, policy on education, for instance, the fact that at, in the average we see that there are no difference anymore between the indigenous populations and the non-indigenous one, it doesn't mean it's true for all the others. It's the same for the labor market, right? Somehow we need to know why certain groups are falling behind compared with the others. So that's um, so I'll answer the first question, um, which asked about um, so fragmentation can uh, does not necessarily have to be a bad thing, especially for the case of India. So there is some work which suggests that this negative impact of fragmentation is much less if there are cross-cutting identities. If the identity of caste cuts across the other identity of maybe language or maybe religion. So in the case of India, for example, Prerna Singh has found out that in Kerala, where the identity of caste cuts with the identity of language, this negative impact does not exist then. However, in India, in other states, caste as an identity still remains important and does not cut across other identities. In fact, it is the other way around. The caste has very significant overlap with economic uh, uh, attainment, uh, attainment of economic outcomes. So because of these overlapping identities between class and caste, caste again has a very important influence on provision of public goods and other economic outcomes. Um, second uh, question regarding public goods provision, uh, we're not trying to explain variation in public goods provision. So that is not our concern. We're just saying if public goods are there, their impact, they will help in reducing inequality. That was our concern. Uh, thirdly, regarding the salience of boundaries, uh, we do find overlapping uh, uh, identities. Uh, we do find an overlap between caste and class using a measure of cross-cuttingness. And then in other paper, we find that this, because of this, a disadvantaged groups, particularly scheduled tribes, have participated because of their disadvantage, have participated in Maoist insurgency, in armed rebellious movements to address their grievances. So yes, this cross-cutting identities have impact uh, as extreme as participation in armed rebellious movements. Yeah. So on the intersection identities part, uh, so our context was very homogenous in terms of ethnicity, but what we are trying to do is look across the 23 countries in that, in that meningitis belt to see if the effect is generalizable. Um, and one of the things that comes up is that a lot of them, you know, you look at the anthropological data on, on bride price practices, much of that swath of the, the region does practice bride price. Um, so there could be in differences in the intensity. There's definitely differences in, in the kind of amounts that are paid based on the education of the woman. Um, and the region of the country, so maybe less in urban educated areas, bride price is less of an issue in, in urban educated areas and in poorer rural areas. Um, so one of the things that, that becomes a concern for us is trying to understand kind of differences by wealth um, uh, and, and basically trying to understand how poorer households basically view daughters as these tradable assets, right? Which is, a, which is a big problem. So if you view your daughters, well, I say selling daughters, which is the, you know, I'm an economist, but anyway, it's, it's, that's the most direct way to describe really what's happening. Um, but uh, if you view your daughter as a, a tradable asset, what does that do? As a, what, what does that mean as a coping mechanism? Especially, you know, I, I mentioned that we've done some work on trying to understand how climate change will affect um, disease going forward. Basically, the consensus is that it will worsen these epidemics in the future. So, so what does that mean in terms of uh, already poor or, or inequality by wealth and already poor households that already view their daughters as this kind of, because of cultural practices, as, as these tradable assets for bright price? So these are the kind of things that we are trying to think about in terms of, of intersecting issues and, and, and identities. Um, yeah, so on um, sample selection, so language is, um, it's, it's much more difficult than, than you'd imagine. Uh, we have a very sort of segregated system of education. Uh, I went to a convent school uh, because of my family background. English is the only language I speak properly and effectively. I, you know, um, 
I can't communicate in in uh, I can communicate, but you know, not very um, in a in a very sophisticated manner, and that is the problem with uh, with. Um, so if I, if you go to Lums, most people will speak perfect English. They'll have immense trouble with with Urdu, which is the national language. If you go to Punjab University, most people will speak beautiful Urdu, but they would have uh, a lot of trouble with 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 English. The problem then becomes that the measure of sexism is not really coming from economics. It's coming from social psychology. And we are not psychologists, so we are worried about how the language of the statement is going to, to you know, so how do we actually translate? So we need a translator that that is fluent both, understands the context in which the statement was made in the sexism measure, and then can translate it in, into Urdu. And, we had really haven't been able to find someone. But it's certainly at the back of our mind. We do realize um, uh, the problem, Professor Stewart has already raised the issue of internal consist uh, external consistency, which is here is you know a little sample from an elite university in a little bubble. Uh, can you really extrapolate to the population? And, and we really can't. Uh, and it's just that we've actually tried several times to run experiments in, in other universities, and it's been remarkably difficult. And we can talk about that over the break. Uh, intersectionality, yeah, that's the next paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>